my fiance and I purchased a foreclosed home in a not so great neighborhood a few years back. We ignored the area because of the great price, but now realize we were idiots because of things like this. I'm lying in bed, barely awake, watching TV. Fiance is still at work, so I can't sleep. It's 2 a.m. and I'm barely dozing to the crime show that was on when I hear scratching at the window. The window that was one foot away from me while lying in bed. I remember thinking, damn squirrels, when I heard those squirrels start cursing and mumbling. Then the sound of a screwdriver lifting the window frame starts up. I start screaming bloody murder that I have a gun and I'm calling the cops. The scratching noise has stopped and by the time the cops got to my door and searched a yard, there was no one there. Thinking, oh great, they think I'm crazy, I thank them, and as they're walking back to the cruisers, the radios all started going off at once, that there was another break-in reported in my neighborhood. The officers go scrambling off, and I slam the door and lock it, once again, freaking out. I get back in the bed to wait for fiancé to get home. He calls and says he's on his way, and wants me to stay on the phone with him until he gets here. I hear loud footsteps on the wooden shed ramp in our backyard and say, Oh, good, you're home, and hung up walking to the back door. He called me straight back and told me that he still wasn't even in the neighborhood. So, once again, I'm calling 911 and losing my shit. He and the cops got there around the same time and searched a yard again. Apparently, they had been getting calls all night about some meth head trying to break into the same few houses all night with a screwdriver. They'd been one step behind him the whole night and had cruisers everywhere. Oh, and the cursing out the window... One of the officers went to the bedroom window and saw the screen removed. Meth Wiz had disturbed a huge wasp nest when he took the screen off, and my tiny little wasp defenders saved the day. To put this into context, I live in a relatively small town with a generally jolly population. Murders weren't really a thing we'd seen that much of. Assaults and other violent crimes were also low. To get to the point, there's a gym here that lies in the shadier part of town, open 24 hours a day for five days a week. And it's rumored to be a haven for the roided and, well, let's just say the odd. This gym, although successful, closed for no apparent reason, just right out of the blue. No one really knew why they were closed, not that anyone cared, except for the other gyms in the city getting the new, unwanted clientele. Two weeks pass and the building where the Roy Jim lied gets rented out to a new startup company, who promptly starts to renovate the building. But there's a strange smell, and no matter how much they clean, the smell won't go away. Police are called and they rip up the floor, revealing a semi-composed body, minus a head. It turned out that the owner of the gym had, in one of his roid rages, decapitated his girlfriend and hid the body under the floor, presumably during the weekend. The police said that the body must have lied there for at least one and a half months, if not more. But the gym had only been closed for three weeks when the discovery was made. So, the owner of the gym had kept his business open, greeted his and his girlfriend's friends at the gate, all while hiding her decapitated body under the floor of the very gym they frequented. After the body was discovered, he was arrested and, as far as I know, he was put in some asylum for the criminally insane. The whole ordeal spawned some crusade on steroids, but later deviated into suspicion towards any muscular man who frequented a gym. I remember my grandma telling me to watch out for the ex-army guy that lived in our apartment complex just because he liked to keep his body fit. Crazy times. A friend of mine worked for a guy who had inherited an old farmhouse way on the woods in deep east Texas. The home had been abandoned for some years and the guy wanted to sell it. So they went out on a work trip to chop down some weeds and make the place viewable to potential buyers. My friend was a teenager at the time and agreed to go out there for a few days. They took a chainsaw, weed whacker, pruning shears, and headed off in the guy's work truck. The place was way back in the woods. It just took them a couple hours to get there from Houston, and an hour or so just to cut the trees off the driveway. When they went back to the house, they saw signs of someone living there. There were trails around the yard and forest and the guy got a handgun and went inside the house. Once inside, it was obvious someone was living in there. Food was being cooked, and the bed was slept on. They found lots of wild hog and catfish remains, 
whoever was living was eating them. Then, things got really weird. They found a domestic pig alive in the shed. There was a closet in the shed with some women's nightgowns and bras. It seemed as if whoever was living there was dressing the pig up in a bad way. Then, I started to find weapons all around the place. A machete, an axe, and sticks. It was obvious whoever was living there had just left when they got there, and they were probably close by in the woods. My friend and the guy he was working for left to go get some more guns and help. My friend would not go back to the place, though, even when the guy offered him another dollar an hour. But he just told him, no thanks. My husband's family owns some land about 45 minutes from San Angelo, close to Bront. It's deep in the heart of Texas, for sure. When his mom was still living out there, we used to stay at the ranch in the hunter's trailer. It's really quiet, and I'm a country girl, so... It's great. We stayed out there when my husband's cousin passed away suddenly, and we were there for about a week. I remember the lights being out on the back porch, so everything was darker than normal. And it's already so dark you can't see past the fence. I was smoking a cigarette by myself and just enjoying the night when I began to look into a twiggy tree. I tend to trick my eyes to challenge my fear reflex, and it looked like a figure was crouching in the tree. I don't scare easily due to dealing with some insane circumstances in my life and systematic meditation, so I found it interesting, but not scary. About two seconds later, I hear a shuffling sound and shifted my eyes down to see what I first thought was deer on its hind legs. I was wondering how it got past the fence when I looked again. Now, it had long arms and what looked like hands, not hooves. Still, I thought I was seeing things or someone was screwing with us and it made me mad. I said, hello? And that thing crouched and looked right at me. The eyes weren't white like a deer's in the glow of the side of the trailer. They were a brownish red. My stomach did about 17 flips and tears came to my eyes. I noped the fuck into the trailer and locked every single door. I felt a sense of dread I've never felt before. I checked on my kids first and told my husband what I saw. He told me he has heard and seen weird things out there since he was little, but he looked legit worried. As we were talking, we heard scratching at the side trailer door. We both freaked out and I started making a knife spear out of a broom and duct tape. I know, but I get mad when I'm scared and I get into this go mode. Finally, everything got quiet and it became kind of a joke after a while. It still bothers me though. I've gone through a variety of scientific possibilities and they don't really fit, or they just end up concerning me more. I don't know. I don't want to say what it might have been and the feeling I get about it. I don't want to go into getting growled out in my ear by a damn mountain lion there. And here's what's even more bizarre. The ranch is pretty close to where Brandon Lawson disappeared. That area is scary without weird deer and lions. Don't jump fences there, or really anywhere. But people are pretty jumpy out there, so mind yourselves and be careful when you're out there. When I was younger, we frequently visited my grandparents around holidays, even though we didn't live in the same town. My aunt lived two houses down from my grandparents, and the lady in the house was, well, she was creepy. She was a large woman, over six feet. She wore logging chains around her neck, a dress, and work boots. The only time I remember seeing her outside was either in her garden in the back or when she was washing the outside of her house, scrubbing the actual building. She did this often. During these times, she would yell at us kids and call us all kinds of things. She would tell us the devil would be coming for us, and the adults even told her to leave us alone and to avoid her. We would run the distance between my aunts and my grandparents because whenever you passed by, she was watching out the windows. It was creepy and we never went alone. One Halloween, one of the cousins dared us to trick-or-treat her house. I remember how scared I was, but I didn't want to be a chicken. Plus, I was going with the group. One of us rang the doorbell, and there was a lot of banging noises in the house, suddenly like doors slamming. When she answered the door, she had a severed head in her hands, and we all went screaming. The adults told us it was just a Halloween prop, and that we knew we shouldn't be bothering her, and we deserved to be scared. About a month later, my parents got a phone call that the lady had tried to kill my aunt while she was bringing in groceries, and 
and she had my young cousin in her arms. The lady had one of them rope saws and had come up behind my aunt with it. She put it over her head and around her neck and proceeded to saw. My aunt naturally flipped and started kicking the door. My uncle came and beat the lady down with a fire poker. The police investigation revealed that the woman had been digging tunnels under her home which were coming up under my aunt's, my grandparents, and another neighbor's house. She had been bringing the dirt up and putting it in the raised beds of the gardens. She also had a shrine of some sort of underground which had a few severed heads around it. My aunt survived, by the way, but she has a long scar across her neck. My wife and I bought our first house in February of 2010. We immediately fell in love with it as soon as we laid our eyes on it. It had everything we wanted, plus a few extras. For the first month, everything was great. Lots of painting and decorating it, getting it just the way we wanted, and then weird things started to randomly happen. First it was small things, like things upstairs being moved, being put in completely different rooms than where they belonged. I just chalked it up to my wife for getting to put things back where they belonged, but then the house also started to creak pretty, pretty loudly. This is a fairly new house, so I just figured it was probably settling, as most new houses tend to do. One day, the wife and I were preparing dinner in the kitchen. Our stairs sit right next to the kitchen entrance, so any noises upstairs were clearly audible into the kitchen. I turned off the water at the sink, and as soon as I did, we both heard a cough. We have no kids, and no one was visiting. The windows were all shut, and the television was not on. This sent the coldest chill down my spine, and I could feel the blood running out of my face. I looked to my wife, and she too has gone pale, and had this look of absolute fear. Someone was in our house, and they were upstairs. I quickly grabbed the sharpest knife I could find, and my wife called the police. I walked to the bottom of the steps and stood silently, and I heard a loud pop slash creak, just like the ones I always heard the house make. My hands were shaking, and my wife was whispering to the 911 operator, telling them that we might have a robber in our home. The police arrive in minutes. Thankfully, they had been nearby. The officer walks slowly up the stairs, gun drawn. He calls out, This is the police! Is anyone upstairs? No response. I'm right behind him walking up the stairs. We look into the first bedroom and closet, and it's empty. No one's in the half bath either. Last room is my office where I have my PC. Again, no one's in the room or the closet. I felt the tension ease away, and I felt like a complete tool, making this officer search the house only to find nothing. We turn to walk out the room, and right above us, a creak sound. I just about shot bricks. In my office closet, there is an attic access. The officer pulls the steps down and again calls out, Is anyone up there? This is the police! No response. He turns on his flashlight and peeks his head up. There, he finds a man in his 40s, kneeling there in the attic, looking dead straight at him. Gun drawn, he tells the man to come out and put his hands behind his head. They arrest the man, and he didn't say a word the whole time and would not look anyone in the eye. He was scruffy looking and he had dirty clothes on, me and my wife were freaking out. I don't think either of us have really fully gone over it. After questioning the man in the police station, we found out that he was a homeless man who found refuge in the house while it was still on the market. He said the doors were unlocked, and so he stayed there. Apparently, a realtor must have forgotten to lock the door after showing someone the house. He said that when people would come to the house, he would hide in the second floor attic. We bought the house, and this guy was living in it for a whole month without us even really knowing. It really freaks me out still, just thinking about it. My family has lived in rural Nebraska since they immigrated from Germany in the mid-1800s. Near the turn of the century, disease was pretty rampant in the homesteading area, and it killed off members of almost every family. When someone died from illness, time was of the essence in burying them, so as to not let the virus spread from the deceased to the living. This meant no wake periods. So. An aunt of some unknown number of grades preceding her relationship to me dies of some disease, and she gets buried in the family cemetery on the homestead. The dogs were very fond of her, so it wasn't too surprising that, after the funeral, the two dogs stuck near the grave. The rest of the family began to think something of it when, a week and a half later, 
the dogs were still visiting her grave, almost constantly. But they weren't just at the grave. They were visibly distressed, frantic, and often barking while there. This goes on for maybe two weeks, when the family decides to check it out. They dig the casket up and open it. The deceased's hair has all been pulled out. Her fingers are raw and bloody and mangled from where, on the inside of the casket door, they can see deep scratches in the wood. She was comatose when they buried her, and she came to while underground, spending probably her last five or so days alive in a buried casket. So my mom remarried about two years ago. My dad died when I was 12, so she had been widowed for over 10 years now. This new relationship was very whirlwind with them meeting, dating, and getting married within three months. I didn't know much about the guy, but my mom was happy, so I just tried to be supportive. She moved into his house in upstate Virginia and invited my fiance and I to spend a weekend in her new home, getting to know her new husband. My mom's new home was pretty isolated. It sat on a few hundred acres of lovely rolling hills and was very picturesque. I was nervous about getting to know this guy, but really trying to make the most of it. Over the course of our first day there, though, I felt more and more uneasy. I didn't think it was weird, just silly. My mom's new husband was being very welcoming and very friendly. We were being made to feel very at home, yet I still couldn't shake this oppressive feeling. I finally chalked it up to me being more upset about my mom getting remarried than I was willing to admit to myself. We spent most of the day wandering around outside since I felt worse when indoors. That night, my fiance and I showered together. When I turned my back to him, he stopped talking mid-sentence and asked, What did you do to your back? Well, nothing. Why? You have a large bruise. I hopped out and tried to see it in the mirror, and I got back in and we finished, showering in silence. Then. It was off to bed. The one window in our room looked out over a pitch black empty field, but I couldn't sleep until I hung something over the window. I felt sure that, otherwise, someone would watch us through the window. The next morning, I had a complete meltdown. I woke up and I just couldn't stop crying. I told my fiance that we had to leave. He tried to calm me down by telling me all the things I'd been telling myself. My feelings of anxiety were just a result of seeing my mom with someone and that the longer I spent with them, the easier it would become. But I just, I had to leave. It was only Saturday morning, and we were supposed to stay until Monday, but I felt completely hysterical. I knew I was on the verge of a panic attack, and my only concrete thought was I had to stop crying long enough to make our excuses and get the hell out. So we did. As soon as we were on the road, I felt like a weight had been lifted. I was even feeling embarrassed for my behavior hoping I hadn't insulted my mom's husband by leaving early. Then, my fiancé broke the silence. That bruise on your back. Did you get a good look at it? I had. It looked like someone had touched the middle of my back, with fingers spread wide, with their hand at a tilt. I went to make it completely clear. No one had touched my back the previous day, and especially hard enough to bruise me. Cut to three weeks later, my mom comes to visit me. The entire time she's hounding me to come stay with her again. After finally trying to change the subject for the fifth time, I just level with her. Before I've even finished telling the story, her face is white as a sheet. She tells me she's been feeling the same way in the house, that she hates it. She wants them to move as soon as possible. And the real kicker? Her new husband's previous wife shot and killed herself right outside in the same field that our room window overlooked. Back in high school, around the end of my junior year, I believe, it became popular to go on these adventurous endeavors to, quote-unquote, haunted places. Literally, a group of about 30 of us would go carpool to some abandoned house one weekend, or to some secluded forest the next, spending the days at school in between searching for more places like this in the area. Anyhow, we had this cavalier nature about us when it came to potential hauntings. At some point, a friend of mine who was several years older than me told me about how he and his friends would do similar things when they were younger. His childhood home backed up to a huge farm, and he and his friends would spend their days fishing or hanging out on this farm. So, they were quite familiar with it. The owner, apparently a very religious man, a priest or a pastor maybe, had owned the farm in a small house on the property. The story went that the owner had been locked up for murder and died in prison. 
leaving the farm to whomever, and it wasn't kept up. However, upon hearing the news of the man's demise, my friend told me that he and his friends had decided to go into his house. I guess the windows had been busted out and they opened up a door and walked in. He described them fooling around and trying to scare one another, but he had decided to walk up the stairs. And upon reaching the second floor, he saw a coffin in the main open room. The way he explained it to me was that he didn't know what it was immediately and sort of sauntered over to check it out, only to have the sudden flash of realization that this was a coffin in an abandoned house. I suppose he and his friends made a quick retreat from the house. Of course, he told this part of the story much better, peppering in more details about the man who owned the property that gave the story that mythical, supernatural sort of feel. I remember being frightened by his delivery and sincerity, though it is quite likely he had rehearsed it before for occasions like that. This story had taken place 15 years or so previous to him telling me. I told one of my adventurous cohorts the story, and we thought it would be a good idea to investigate it. I knew where this person had lived, so we assumed we could simply walk behind his house, find the farm, and then find the house. We had a grand plan to bring the whole group out on the weekend, but we weren't sure if we were being strung on a lie, or if this place was still there, if it were true. Anyhow, after football practice one weekday, he and I drove out to the street that my friend lived on. There was definitely a farm behind his and his entire street's homes. We decided to go ahead and sneak through someone's yard and onto the farm to see if the house was there. Once we made it through the manicured suburban yard and through the brush separating the farm, we were suddenly knee deep in an overgrown field. We sort of hacked our way through a bit and sure enough, as we made it to the edge of a hill, the house was only a hundred or so yards away. We had made it that far, so we decided to go in and investigate. As we approached his house, there was this huge black bird perched on its roof, and once we were within 20 feet of the house, the bird flew away from the house and perched upon a tree adjacent to the house. It had that quaint, historic look to it, with the broken windows, eerie shadows, and sort of ominous stature that one associates with a haunted house. There was even a grave marker in the front yard. So, again, we were increasingly nervous as we approached his house. The door was jammed shut, but the window had been completely removed, so we just played rock, paper, scissors for who would climb through first. I had the luxury of going in second, but did so quickly as being on the porch by myself was just as unsettling. The inside of the house had literally not been touched. Besides weather damage, mostly everything was intact. There were pictures and decorations still up with a bit of furniture remaining. We eventually became comfortable with it being inside and began to snoop around. Of course, we were fearful of trekking upstairs, afraid to find something that we didn't want to find. Alas, we squeamishly crept up the stairs, only to find an empty space. At this point, we became at ease with walking around the house, laughing off the ghost story mystique. As we looked through the main floor again, I noticed that there was a tiny door in the kitchen. It was about knee high. Undauntedly, we flung it open, only to reveal a dark stone stairwell that a person would literally have to crawl down. Its presence alone was terrifying for some reason, but it had a landing about halfway down, with the stairs turning a different direction and out of our sight. However, perched on the landing and partly concealed by the walls to the other part of the stairwell was a large, rectangular, wooden box, a coffin. Now, my friend and I weren't exactly small people, so I would imagine the sight of us pale-faced with a cartoonish hair on neck shocked expression, trying to both squeeze out of a window at the same time would have been quite comical. Not to mention the both of us in a dead sprint heading away from this house through waist high weeds. I still laugh thinking about both of us running like that. Anyhow, we turned to look back about halfway to the end of the farm, just in time to see that massive black bird fly back from the tree and onto the house. We probably made double time from that point on. I know it's not nearly as cool as the other stories, but it's as close as I've been to it. In hindsight, the whole thing was a bit odd, most especially the behavior of the bird. My friend and I attributed it to some sort of supernatural power. So, at the very least, we had a better reason to run like children. <laughs>